Good afternoon to everybody. I will uh, represent shortly our uh, successful scientific project based on chemistry of hydrogen and oxygen. Um, first, I will briefly represent some background of this chemistry area. Unfortunately, I'm limited to show only two condensed slides. So we are talking about very simple compounds, water, from left to right, water, hydrogen peroxide, which are uh, the only no naturally stable compounds consisting of elements of hydrogen and oxygen. And the existence of hydrogen trioxide, which is on the right side, which is the higher homologue, has been assumed to be, um, <clears throat> is assumed for about 100 years. However, the first reliable reports of this of its existence date back to the 60s of the last century. I have to stress that the molecule of hydrogen trioxide is unstable at room temperature, but is stable uh, in ether or alcohol solutions, for example, at temperatures below 30 degree, minus 30 degree. In the last three decades, research of this in this field has become more intense mainly due to the development of experimental methods for the preparation and characterization of hydrogen trioxide. An important part of this research has been made in Ljubljana at our university. Hydrogen trioxide attracted wider scientific um, interest since the discovery that all antibodies are capable of catalyzing the oxidation of water by singlet oxygen to generate hydrogen peroxide and an oxidant with chemical signature of ozone. It was postulated that antibodies carry the reaction through hydrogen trioxide as the key reaction intermediate. Later, it was experimentally confirmed that hydrogen trioxide is actually formed during thermal reaction of hydrogen peroxide and ozone. This reaction is shown at the center of the slide and demonstrated for the first time that a link exists between hydrogen peroxide, ozone, and hydrogen trioxide. These three oxidants might actually be involved in oxidation processes that span atmospheric, environmental, and biological systems, which means that hydrogen trioxide is one of the key intermediates involved in the biochemical oxidation processes, such as atherosclerosis, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, as well as in chain processes in the environment and in the atmosphere, which is represented at the bottom of the slide, some different areas where we can find this molecule. Next slide, please. Therefore, the stable nature of the hydrogen trioxide molecule and the presence of other contaminants using different methods of its preparation our main major obstacles that this compound become more accessible to wider scientific audience. Therefore, simple and efficient methods for preparation of pure solutions of hydrogen trioxide represent significant progress in this area. On the left side of um, this presentation, we can see two basic most common methods for hydrogen trioxide preparation based either on two hydrogen atom abstraction by ozone molecule or ozone attack or the ozone attack on organic molecule forming polyoxide inter intermediate which upon catalytic rearrangement re release hydrogen trioxide. Our method show on a figure right offers some key advantages which are Preparation of an effective polymer bearing reactive, reactive group, ozone trapping on the polymer, catalytic release of hydrogen trioxide from solid polymer into solution and polymer and solvent removal. Further, possible solvent exchange and preparation of various solutions and convenient and simple storage of prepared solutions of hydrogen trioxide. Further, we go further on and test possible applications of hydrogen trioxide chemistry. Namely, recently, an in situ generated hydrogen trioxide from ozone hydrogen peroxide vapor system 
which is also named peroxone system, has been tested as a part of an advanced oxidative process, providing a rapid and effective disinfection of healthcare surfaces and spaces containing bacterial pathogens. Some very interesting findings comes out and can be seen at the first table left. Namely, ozone hydrogen peroxide system vapor, vapor system and mixture is far more reactive and, and kills bacteria, MRSA bacteria, than any other, like say ozone or hydrogen peroxide alone. So it's far more reactive. At the same time, uh, this vapor system was successfully employed in killing various bacterial pathogens shown in second table. In all cases, log 10 reduction of pathogens was more than six. Finally, to conclude, peroxone chemistry based on in situ generated hydrogen trioxide is completely green and their application has great potential in view to present global crisis and health concerns. It could be implemented in, the, in this affection of public places in pharmaceutical food and cosmetics industry in municipal water systems, swimming pools, spas, as well as in oil, green water, green, <laughs> water and wastewater decontamination. I have to stress that we already collaborate with Belinka per chemistry, Slovenian chemical company, which is the largest producer of hydrogen peroxide in this region in Europe, as well as two small private Slovenian business companies trying to commercialize our research. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you for uh, opening of this session. Uh, do we have a question? Uh, I don't see any questions, so we will move to the next presentations. Uh, Andrea Venchan Gulop. Okay, we can see you. Dobar dan. Okay, Ivan, hello. Yeah, hello. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Torej, moja predstavitev bo v Slovenščini, zahvaljujem se organizatorjem za povabilo. Rada bi vam um, pokazala rezultate na uh, razlage leksične prevodnosti domenskih s tem bizmotovega perita. Ta študija je bila leta 2017 prepoznana kot odlična iz strani Javne agencije za raziskovalno dejavnost. Uh, in je, po moje zelo dober primer zelo uspešne sodelave, tako lokalne kot globalne. Gre za študijo, pri kateri so delovali raziskovalci iz dveh slovenskih inštitucij, to je iz Jošefa Štefana in Kemijskega inštituta. Znotraj Jošefa Štefana so, bil, so, de, so sodelovali tri oceki, elektronska keramika, anorganska kemija in tehnologija te raziskave sodobnih materialov. Poleg tega smo imeli še dva kolega iz Šizjoke univerze, iz Japonske in pa iz epfl iz Švice. Torej, bismo to ferit, je poleg vseh svojih lasnosti tudi pezo elektrik, zanimiv material, zaradi tega, ker lahko s tem, da ko ga deformiramo, ustvarimo električni impuls ali obratno, ko na njega dovedemo elektriko, se tak material deformira, to uporabljamo potem v aplikacijah, v različnih senzorih, pretvornikih, preklopnikih um, in se pravzaprav s takimi vrsti materiale, materialov uh, srečujemo vsakodnevno. Ta posebna lasnost izhaja iz njihove kristalne strukture, pravimo, da imajo preuskitno strukturo. Um, če si predstavljamo kocko, v sredini te kocke je majhen atom, v tem primeru je to železo, um, pod uh, fazno transformacijo ima ta majhen železo to možnost, da se premakne iz svoje centralne lege. Uh, tvori se tako imenovani dipol, področja z enakomerno usmerjeno uh, polarizacijo oziroma dipoli imenujemo domene in ko se ta različna področja srečujejo, prihajajo do neke meje, kateri se reče domenska stena. Ta domenska stena je izjemno zanimiva iz stališča strukture, to je neka mejhna nanometerska tvorba, ki ima pa ponavadi lahko različne lasnosti, kot kar matrični materijal. Prosila bi za naslednjo prosojnico. Prosim, če zamenjate prosojnico. Torej, um, 
Želite 2009 so v eksperimentalno v resnici ugotovili, da so te domenske stine bolj prevodne in sam material v resnici bi smo oferiti, ima problem v uporabi v aplikativnosti, ker je preveč prevoden. Bi bilo pa jasno, kaj je ta mehanizem, ki izhaja, kaj je mehanizem te prevodnosti na domenski sten in zato smo se odločili, da kar direktno pogledamo na domensko steno in in pogledamo, če so kakšni defekti gor, ki nekako lahko povzročajo to prevodnost. To nam omogočajo naprave, ki seveda vidijo, ki imajo možnost atomske resolucije. Na srečo imamo dostop do takega mikroskopa na kemijskem inštitutu. Z presevno vrstično elektronsko mikroskopijo smo poanalizirali te domenske stene. Na tej prosojnici vidite en tak primer slike. Te svetlejše pike so bizmutove kolone, v sredini so temnejše pike, to so železove kolone in z neko kvantitativno in pač z iz takih slik lahko z meritvijo opredelimo, kako ta domenska stena zgleda, ne samo to, ne samo njeno morfologijo, temveč tudi iz preko intenzitet lahko definiramo, ali imamo kakšne defekte v teh bizmotovih kolonah in tudi z uporabo dodatne spektroskopije, valenčno stanje železa. Rezultat teh analiz je bil, da v resnici poznamo tipa defektov, ki segregirajo na domenskih stenah, to so bizmutove vakance in pa elektronske lukne, ki so povezane z prisotnostjo železa štir plus na teh domenskih stenah in te elektronske lukne so pravzaprav vzrok te povečane prevodnosti. Ko smo to razumeli, smo lahko material pripravili brez ali z prevodnimi domenskimi stenami, uspeli objaviti v pomembni revi na področju materialov, Moram reči, da še do zdaj dobivamo kar dobro, dobivamo zelo dobro odzive na naše delo. Kako vidimo to v bodoče, na kje bi bilo to zelo uporabno, predvsem zdi se nam, da so ti rezultati uporabni v nano elektroniki. Želimo pa si seveda, da bi lahko te takšni tip raziskal mogoče kdaj tudi upeljali na področju slovenske industrije, ko je bo seveda to potrebno. Hvala lepa. Hvala za predstavitev. Now it's time for questions. We are open for questions in Slovenian and in English. Okay, no questions. So we will continue with the next presentations. I would like to invite Christian Radan from Jožev Štefan Institute. The floor is yours. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you and we can also okay. see you. Okay, hello everybody. So I prepared my talk in Slovenian language as well, but if there will be any questions, please feel free to um, uh, to ask in English. Uh, Tore, um, kemija žlaknih plinov, uh, ker gre za prece eksotično, uh, vejo kemije bom začel s kratkim uvodom in sicer začelo se je s profesor dr. Neil Bartletom, ki je uspel oksidirati kisik s spojino imenovano PTF6 naprej. In ta PTF6 je potem uporabil tudi, ko je prepoznal oksidacijski potencijal, da gre za izredno močnega oksidanta, je potem z njim oksidiral tudi ksenon v zgodovinskem eksperimentu naprej. In ta eksperiment, pri čemer je nastala prva spojina z žlaknim plinom XEPDF6, se je uvrstil tudi med deset najlepših eksperimentov v zgodovini kemije. Zanimivo, da prva spojina žlaknim plinom ni bila običajen, navaden binarni florid, te so bili sintetizirani malče kasneje in sicer poznamo XEF2, XEF4, pa XEF6, Tukaj vidimo XF2 na naslovnici ISN-ovic, gre za brezbarne kristale. In ta XF2 je posebej zanimiv, zato ker lahko z njim sintetiziramo tudi nadaljne spojine z žlahnimi plini. Predvsem je zanimivo to, da lahko z ustreznimi ljusivimi kislinami, s katerimi lahko abstrahiramo floridni ion iz XF2, naredimo različne soli, ampak do tega našega dosežka so bile znavne samo soli tipa tu spode, se pravi tukaj prikazano na antimonovi liniji, torej tri taki tipi so bile. 
prosim. Um, mi smo se skoncentrirali na raziskave med ksenonovim difloridom in titanovim tetrafloridom, te raziskave je začel že moj bivši mentor, profesor dr. Boris Ženga, leta 1975 in sicer je vršil termične reakcije med tema dvema spojinama, kjer je identificiral tri faze, no in en od teh faz smo kasneje preko eksperimentov v brezvodnem vodikovem floridu uspeli tudi izkristalizirati in določiti kristalno strukturo. To je šlo za tri proti dva fazo prikazano tu spodaj, tudi brezbarni kristali naprej. No, to, kar se je pa, dokr pa se je uvrstilo dosežek pač v odlični znanosti strani RRS, so bile pa termične reakcije med kse dva in titanovim tetrafloridom, ki smo jih leta 2014 izvršili na malo drugačen način, in sicer preko uporabe specialnih floroplastik. Nastali so dva tipa kristalov in sicer take podogovati kristalčke in pa take lekockasti, prizmatski kristalčke, ki smo jih identificirali naprej. Za podogovate se je izkazalo, da gre za nov tip soli, za Xe2F3 plus kationum v obliki črke V, Naprej, medtem za te kockaste pa se je izkazalo, da se je XF2 pripel na prizme titanovega tetraflorida. Zdaj, ta raziskava, naprej, prosim, ta raziskava je bila posebej pomembna zaradi tega, ker smo prvič na tak način ionizirali XF2 in sintetizirali soli tega tipa. Obenem pa so tele dve spoji, čeprav se bojo jo žlahtni plin, izjemno termično odporne. Pripravili smo jih namreč pri 135 stopinjah Celzija. Naprej, prosim. No, za naprej pa bi, za naprej pa bi lahko te raziskave nadaljevali tudi na drugih sistemih. Tukaj je prikazana ena analogna struktura s kositrom, kjer se je izkazalo, da imamo take valovite polianjone, Obenem bomo pa tudi uporabili ekstremne pogoje, nizke temperature in visoke tlake in tudi vi le povabljeni, da obiščete našo spletno stran in novo ustanovljenega laboratorija za kemijo pod ekstremnimi pogoji in pa, da se nam če vas zanima, tudi pridružite. Hvala. Ok, thank you for the presentation. Now it's time for questions. Če lahko bi jaz vprašala, sem zanima me, ki je, hvala za prezentacijo, pa če lahko mogoče, ki je v praksi se to lahko uporablja? Ja, spojine žlaknih plinov se že uporabljajo, recimo za unos F18 radioizotopa v pozitronske misinske tomografiji. Ksev 2 sam se uporablja tudi za jetkanje, medtem, ko recimo te dve konkretne spojine bi se lahko uporabljajo za razne oksidacije v specialnih topilih. Pa tudi v organski kemiji se floridi žlaknih plinov uporabljajo za floriranje. Tako da Ksev 2 recimo se da kupiti na trgu. Aha, tukaj, torej tudi... Hvala za vprašanje. Pravzaprav sem hotel tudi to sprašati, ali zato, že razmišljate o smeri kakšnih bolj, ko bi rekel, aplikativnih projektov na tem področju? Razmišljamo že, ampak konkretnih sodelav pa še nimamo, oziroma tako je, da tukaj gre res za bazično znanost, te spojine same po sebi že težko narediti, aplikacije pa potem naslednje stopnje. Torej, najprej smo prebili tole začetno stvar. Naprej pa seveda reakcije mogoče v organski kemiji, kataliza, floriranje površin in tako dalje. Hvala lepa za prezentacijo. Thank you very much. We will continue with the next presentation by Mitja Luštrek, also from Jožev Stefan Institut. Mitja, can we hear each other? Uh, yes, okay. uh, I can hear you. Hopefully you can hear me. 
We can hear you, but not see you. Uh, yeah, that's because I don't have a camera. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay, so obviously I'll also proceed in Slovene. Tako da lahko date naslednjo prosojnico. Uh, najprej bom pojasnil, zakaj pri poznavanju aktivnosti pravzaprav gre. Uh, naprej, prosim. Uh, se pravi, imamo uh, recimo pametne telefone ali pa druge naprave, ki jih nosimo na telesu, kot recimo za pesnice za spremljanje fizične aktivnosti in te naprave proizvajajo kup senzorskih podatkov, pospeške, lokacije skozi GPS, magnetno polje, merjo in še marsikaj. Tale slika kaže recimo pospešek pri različnih človekovih aktivnostih. Naprej prosim. No, in iz tajega pospeška lahko s pomočjo strojnega učenja zgradimo model za prepoznavanje aktivnosti. Recimo, tukaj le bi bil prvi atribut, ki bi ga pogledal lahko v povprečni pospešek. Če je zelo majhen, imamo mirovanje, to je tam na sliki na začetku. Potem, če je majhen, je to lahko eno od prevoznih sredstov, to so zadnji štirje pospeški na sliki. Če je srednje kolo, če je velik, je teka lihoja. Naprej prosim. Na, pa pa lahko pogledamo še periodo pospeška, pa s pomočjo tega ločimo tek pa hojo. Zdaj pa, kako nam to pomaga? Lahko to vključimo v kakšno aplikacijo, ki spremlja življenjski slok in spodbuja zdravo življenje. Lahko to uporabljamo za prilaganje aplikacij, recimo, če imamo aplikacijo za navigacijo, lahko deluje drugač, če hodimo peš, če se vozimo z avtobusom, če se vozimo z avtom in lahko to tudi uporabljamo za pomoč raznovrstnim kroničnim bovnikom. Pri teh je telesna aktivnost pogosto predvsej pomembna stvar, pa tudi razumevanje njihovega življenjskega sloga lahko pomaga zdravnikom ali pa računalnikom, da jim bolj svetuje v glede obvladovanja bolezni. Naprej? No, zdaj sem predstavil, zakaj pri prepoznavanju človekovih aktivnosti nasploh gre, ampak glede na to, da imam tukaj le tole predstavitev, smo očitno morali pa mi nekaj posebnega na to temo narest. No, in ena stvar, ki smo jo naredili, je, da smo reševali uspešno problem, da ljudje te telefone in nosljive naprave nosijo na dost različne načine. Recimo tukaj le vidimo, človek ima lahko telefon v žepu, lahko ga ima v torbi in pospešek se bo obnašal predvsej drugač in tudi model, ki bo ta pospešek uporabljal, bo deloval drugač. Če bo recimo zgrajen za takrat, ko ima človek telefon v žepu, ne bo deloval, ko bo imel telefon v torbi. Pa tudi človek ima lahko eno, drugo, obe napravi, skratka različne možnosti in fino je, če bi mi pravilno prepoznavali aktivnosti, ne glede na to, kaj je uporabnik v danem trenutku izbral. Naprej prosim. No, zaradi tega smo razvili metodo, ki najprej preveri za vse naprave, a jih človek trenutno ima na telesu ali ne. Naprej. No, potem za telefon zaznamo hojo, kar se da narest, ne glede na to, kje telefon je, ker je taka zelo označilna aktivnost. Naprej. Potem, ko vemo, da je človek v drži hoje, lahko normaliziramo orientacijo telefona in potem še z modelom z grajenim strojnim učenjem zaznamo položaj telefona na telesu. Naprej, prosim. No, potem, ko to vemo, se pa lahko lotimo prepoznavanje aktivnosti in sicer smo zgradili različne modele za različne konfiguracije teh sensorskih naprav in smo pač uporabili vsadzga glede na trenutno situacijo. Naprej. 
In če se pa zgodil, da je človek telefon vzel recimo v roko, ga nimel več na telesu, smo pa to tudi zaznali in smo potem to resetirali, pa ponovno prepoznali lokacijo. In na ta način smo, lahko nazaj prosim, na ta način smo izboljšali prepoznavanje za približno deset odstotnih točk. No, potem še en dosežek, na katerega smo kar ponosni, je pa udeležili smo se tekmovanja, ki ste ga organizirali Univerza v Sussexu in Huawei, a lahko nazaj prosim. In to tekmovanje je bilo organizirano tako, da smo dobili posnetke z označenimi aktivnostmi, potem smo razvili metode za prepoznavanje aktivnosti, z njimi smo prepoznali aktivnosti na neoznačenih posnetkih in na koncu so organizatorji povedali, kdo je bil najboljši. No in kot se je že malo prej razkrilo, smo na tem tekmovanju tudi zmagali. No, To je pa to, kar imam zapovedati. Če imam kakšno vprašanje, bom z veselim odgovoril. Ne, vprašanje, tako da bo kaj na delaz z nekajno predstavitijo. In sicer vesna že ga rad se res kvar in Miroslav Pojemaru iz univerze v Mariboru, kateta za civilno inženirstvo, transportno inženirstvo in arhitekturo. Se slišimo. Can we hear each other? Se slišimo. Ok, we can hear you. Please, the floor is yours. Ja. Slišite? We can hear you, but we cannot see you. A me slišite? Vas slišimo, sam vas ne vidimo. Halo, se slišimo? Gospod Vesno? Mi vas slišimo, takar, če vidite prezentacijo, bi jo skaj prosil. Seems that we have uh, technical problems, so we will continue with the next presentation and uh, come back later. Um, next speaker is Kristina Ivancic from uh, Geological Survey of Slovenia. Kristina, can yes. you? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, Hello. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Kristina Ivancic from Geological Survey of Slovenia. I am very glad to present basic geological research and explain why it's important not only for the geology but also for the society. Uh, me and uh, my colleagues Milka Krijanova, Dragomir Stebarne and Andrej Schmutz were investigating sedimentary evolution of the Slovene Gradets Basin. So if you are wondering if some betting on the Slovene Gradets Sandy Beach is possible, uh, you have to listen. The next slide. Um, Slovene Gradec Basin represents the yellow area between Pohorje, uh, Southern Alps, Paški Kozi, dakle Železno Kapelske, Mahmatska Cona, Karavanke and Strojna. Basin also represents area where sedimentation took place between 17 and 15 million years ago. It's filled with uh, alternation of different plastic sedimentary rocks uh, like conglomerate, uh, sandstone, siltstone, Claystone and Merstone. Our goal was to define origin and basic sedimentological characteristic of these complex Miocene sedimentary successions. Uh, next slide. 
uh, three different sedimentary environments were established, uh, terrestrial, transitional and shallow marine. And during specific period, the area was covered by the central Paratiti Sea. Fossil remains uh, of the sea, like oyster shields, and can be observed in the rocks macroscopically, while uh, red algae, benthic and planktic foraminifera, bryozoan, um, can be seen in thin sections, so microscopically. Uh, two types of transitional environment were determined deltic, um, represented by laterally bedding outward of conglomeratic beds and brackish, defined by gastropod. In periods of sea level low stand, sedimentation took place in high energy fluvial environment and uh, in the restricted swamps where conditions for the formation of coal were created. Uh, next slide. Uh, proven provenance and direction of sedimentary input was determined by uh, sedimentary textures like cross bedding implications and by class analysis uh, we propose of placing a pebble or grain in the source area. For example, tonnelet fiber uh, derived from the Gilesno Kapriska Magmatska Zona. Bridge indicate short transport and uh, vicinity of hinterland. Results of geochemical analysis in, indicate provenance from the Eastern Alps. Um, based, uh, based on the result of different discriminant functions and triangular plots, uh, sediments were subjected to different tectonic settings. Collisional, uh, which is related to the collision of the Adriatic and Eurasian tectonic plates and the formation of the Alpine, uh, Alpine origin and drifting related to the formation of the Pannonian Basin system. Um, you are probably wondering why this is so important for the society. Well, next slide. Um, with this basic geological research, we managed to reconstruct paleogeographic and paleoenvironmental changes and the alternation through the Earth's history, which place was highland, which lowland, which covered by uh, the sea. And every paleogeographic and tectonic change influenced the climate in the past and understanding geological events in the past um, help us to understand present conditions on the Earth. Moreover, classic sedimentary rocks are the most exposed uh, hazardous landslide areas. Based on detailed geological research, landslide and rockfall susceptibility maps were made. By considering such maps and models, the most hazard-prone areas can be avoided. If I go back to the beginning, some betting on the Slovenian sandy beach was possible, but unfortunately, 15 million years ago and not now. That's all from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, I see no questions. Uh, in the meantime, I see that uh, the previous uh, presenters have joined us. Uh, so we will uh, go to their presentation. Welcome to the webinar. Can we hear each other? Yeah. Okay, the connection is bad, but uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Ampak uh, mene slišite? Ja, ja. Dobro. Uh, pozdravljeni. Hello. We will also present in English. So uh, we're going to present uh, to co my colleague and me. So uh, the first part is more arch architectural part. And uh, the main question of our research, of course, of course is uh, why uh, do we need to cope with comprehensive building renovation? Uh, this is actually a wide area of research. Uh, we know that existing buildings are uh, in different states, in different states regarding uh, usability, energy efficiency, structural stability. And of course, um, there is another issue uh, there is a really a big shortage of reconstruction and in city areas 
So uh, we need to build new uh, usable floor areas, which are not possible to build in new building plots because there are no free building plots in the center in, in the center of big European cities. So actually, uh, this is also the reason why we are thinking in the direction of building renovation with upgrade modular modular extension. And another big issue is, of course, that a relatively low percentage of new built uh, construction uh, is representing only 1% of the total housing stock. This means that about 99% uh, of the buildings are existing buildings uh, that need to be uh, renovated or at least maintained. So basically, uh, we deal with different approaches to building renovation, which needs to be comprehensive. But uh, next slide, crossing. Next slide. Uh, but uh, we have focused into, let's say, more energy efficient area. Our research question was uh, firstly, uh, what is the optimal approach to energy efficiency renovation of the existing building? Yes, and the second, what kind of building extension is, is appropriate? So we have designed different types of timber glass modules with different uh, U-values, uh, with uh, different percentages of uh, roof covering and with different number of stories. And of course, the basic question is why timber glass modules? because timber is lightweight material and it doesn't represent uh, additional loads on the building and glass is really energy efficient material because it allows the solar gains uh, through the glazing to contribute to lower energy demand for heating. And now we, I would like to continue with the lecture of Professor Rembrandt. Uh, yes, the second point of this comprehensive, comprehensive renovation is also the structural stability. And as, as Vesna said, by upgrading of buildings, uh, there is the problem with additional vertical load, which is presented. And uh, the, the primary is also the additional horizontal load because of wind. And uh, most important is in Slovenia also this uh, seismic action because Slovenia is very seismic, heavy seismic. Uh, area. So it's very important also by one to three story buildings to upgrade with the light uh, structures and uh, timber is a very light material and because of that we can use uh, timber buildings, um, predominantly timber frame buildings, which is the most light uh, type of timber uh, building and uh, by using glass uh, to gain uh, solar gains also in the building. And the next slide, please. Because of that, we developed special uh, timber glass modules, which was uh, tested in Skopje on ISIS Institute on the seismic, on the shaking table. And we then improved uh, the structural stability, the seismic stability with anchors, metal anchors. And the most important thing is to put the whole utility into metal elements, so in these uh, anchors, and especially not in glass, because the glass is very unductive, very uh, unductive and cheap material. And we also measure the natural frequencies and from the results on the presented on the um, right side, bottom, we can see that there is practically no difference in first frequency before and after seismic shaking uh, table test. And we tested up to 0.5 G. So this is very heavy seismic action. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Primro, uh, sorry for a wrong uh, pronunciation. Um, are there any questions? Uh, if not, I will have my, a question uh, myself. Um, standard uh, question of uh, TT officer: uh, Are the, the your findings uh, already uh, applied in uh, in the real buildings uh, on site? Yeah, this is a question for me or for Vesna? For both of you. Uh -huh. Then the lady first, please. <laughs> 
Yeah, so basically, uh, all our research is already used in the real projects in, uh, let's say, uh, also in some students' competitions. Uh, we have done also for Proholz Austria the projects for uh, middle school in Graz. Uh, it was the basis for the later possibilities of realization. It's not that one of our projects was uh, realized, but at least uh, our findings were used in different uh, competitions all over the, this area of Europe. Uh, so uh, we, we try to use this in practice. And also in one project, um, IQ Home, uh, we have done such a modular, uh, let's say, modulus, timber glass modulus, and uh, we have additionally tried to research some uh, Um, but uh, I think we we uh, we got uh, the, the most of the answer. So thank you both uh, for the nice presentations, and we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, Doman Lichtan from Invit uh, Do and biotechnical faculty will have uh, next presentation. Uh, can we hear each other? Yes. Can you hear, you? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Uh, not so well. Not so well. What about okay, now? Okay, now it's okay. Now it's okay. okay. Please, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Uh, and with limited research and development small enterprise, and a spin-out company from University of Ljubljana and the University of Ljubljana in collaboration developed so-called resoil uh, technology for removal and simultaneous immobilization of residual heavy metals and other pollutants in contaminated soils and sediments. Resoil is therefore soil and sediment remediation method. And it is now the sole owner of resoil intellectual property rights and technology provider. Contamination of soils with so-called heavy metals, such as lead, zinc, cadmium, copper, and arsenic long remained unsolved worldwide problem. Heavy metals cannot decay and are persistent in the environment. In Europe, an estimated 6.2% or close to 140,000 square kilometers of agricultural land needs assessment and, uh, uh, and eventual remediation. In China, one sixth of the total cultivated land is contaminated with heavy metals. Urban soil in particular acts as an integrator of decades of pollution. In New York, 71% of home garden soil samples exceeds legislative limits for lead and arsenic. More than 50% of crop samples from the Berlin inner city vegetable gardens exceeds European Union standards for lead concentration in food crops. In recent burning of Notre Dame Cathedral roof and spire, the flames engulfed 460 tons of lead and, scatter, and scattering dangerous dust into the streets and parks of Paris. The harmful pandemic effect of heavy metals on human health is well documented, documented and governments are setting the remediation of contaminated soils as a national priority. Currently, sites contaminated with toxic metals are mostly being excavated and the soil landfilled as a hazardous waste. Soil, however, is a non-renewable substrate with an extremely slow pace of regeneration. War soils are under serious threat from the modern society and increased urbanization and from cataclysmic events of erosion caused by cl climate changes. New remediation technologies are therefore sought that are, not capable of both, that are capable of both mitigation of pollution and preserving an acclimation of soil as indispensable natural resource. Next slide, please. Our resoil technology operates in a closed process loop, recycles the main reagent and all process water by using inexpensive and waste materials. Very little fresh water is needed, no waste water is generated. Very little solid waste is generated and this could be reused as a matter of resource in a circular economy. The remediation process and the remediated soil and sediments are free of toxic emissions. Resoil technology removes heavy metals 
and preserve soil as a productive natural resource. It addresses all three aspects of sustainability, economic, economic, environmental, and social. Minimal in infrastructure requirements enables for on-site operation using mobile resource remediation units. The resource economy is the economy of scale. The overall cost is expected to decrease with the quantity of soil taken into remediation. The resource technology is applicable in reclamation of parks and other public areas with contaminated soil, contaminated agricultural land, brownfields, ports, military shooting grounds, etc. All around the world, urban agriculture is booming, often on contaminated soil, fulfilling diverse economic and social functions and reducing food mileage. Remediation and reclamation of urban soils for production of safe food is perhaps the most exciting and challenging prospect of using resource. The resource technology is highly innovative and is internationally protected by three patents. It is regarded as a breakthrough market disturbing technology. Resoil was awarded the seal of excellence from the European Union Commission. This allows projects with resoil technology to access EU structural funds and cohesion funds. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Uh, there is a lot of interest now. Um, Dusko Odic. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> apologies if I missed it in the presentation, but uh, was it explained what is the mechanism of uh, remediation or uh, heavy metal removal that is being used here? Mm. No, I didn't explain that because uh, I thought that the audience was with uh, the audience is from different disciplines. So the, this, is a, this is a chemical remediation. So the uh, toxic elements are removed by using calcium agents. And this uh, the innovation is basically uh, uh, the innovations are basically how to recycle these calcium agents, reuse them, and also how to recycle the, all the processed water in the closed process loop. So is then uh, the soil uh, taken from the field and then yes, used in yes. this, and then later yes. returned? Yes, or? the soil is taken from the field. Is it, it is extracted uh, while, it mm -hmm. while it is transporting, and then the process solutions are then it's separate. The, 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 then the soil and process solutions are separated. The soil is returned to the site, and the process solutions are recycled and treated. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question and answer. And uh, remaining questions, please address in the chat box. We will move to the next presentations by Anili Glavash from Soline Deo. We yes, hello. You hear me? Also hear you, so please, the floor is yours. Okay, I will continue in Slovenian. Torej, lep pozdrav sem skupaj in hvala organizatorjem za pobabilo. Torej, čeprav razumem, je cilj te konference prikazati prenos znanja iz raziskovalnih inštitucij v industrijo. No, mislim, da je takle primer sodelovanje morske biološke postaje, torej note Nacionalnega inštituta za biologijo in podjetja Soline pridelava soli. Solinsko okolje je zaradi svojih ekstremnih pogojev odvedno privlačilo raziskovalce. Naše sodelovanje se je začelo leta 2008, takrat sem v okviru programa mladih raziskovalcev se zaposlila na morski biološki postaji in pod mentorstvom dr. Cenive Skovač začela raziskovati solinsko okolje. To počnem še danes, vendar iz drugega zornega kota saj sem v podjetju zaposlena kot razvojna tehnologinja. Na sečovskih solinah poteka tradicionalna predelava soli, ki sloni na gojenju, mikrobne plasti, ki prikriva dno kristalizacijskih bazenov in ji pravimo petola. Gre le za nekaj milimetrov debelo plast, ki jo sestavljajo tako mikroorganizmi kot minerali. Tukaj na sliki lahko vidite prečni prerez petole z zgornjim oksičnim slojem in spodnjim enoksičnim sedimentom. Torej, naše raziskave so pokazale in potrdile, da ima petola pomembno vlogo pri pridelavi visoko kvalitetne bele soli, na kateri v bistvu tudi zaslovelo mesto Piran. Namreč ravno prav debela, primerno 
pripravljena, ter ne poškodovana petola, zagotavlja z dosno čvrstost in prožnost podlage, da lahko na njej pobiramo so visoke kvalitete. Priprava sezonske petole je zahtevno delo in poteka preko celega leta. Torej, strukturo petole smo poročevali s pomočjo visoko zmogljivega vrstičnega elektronskega mikroskopa. Ta črnobela slika tukaj na slajdu prikazuje fino strukturo petole, ki lahko vidimo, kako ta anorganska komponenta, torej ti minerali, so prepleteni z nitastimi cianobakterijami. Za te organizme je značilno, da izločajo velike količine izvenceličnih polisaharidov, ki imajo pomembno vlogo kot zaščita in kot strukturno vlogo. V primeru petole so pa naše raziskave pokazali tudi tako imenovano novo inženirsko vlogo cianobakterije in v smislu, da glinen in drugi strukturni minerali petole so tako ujeti v tej organski mreži in posledično se ne morejo pomešati z sahalitom in drugimi soli, ki kristalizirajo iz slanice in posledično tudi pripomorejo k bolj beli soli. Z tem grafičnim prikazom pa sem želela povdariti, da so naše raziskave pokazali tudi na sezonsko spremenljivost, torej kemijske sestave petole, pa tudi same mikrobne združbe. Namreč koncentracija slanice, torej slano slanice v kristalizacijskih bazenih, kjer je petola, lahko se v poletnem času poveča tudi za recimo faktor 8. Naslednji slajd, prosim. Torej, na sečovskih solinah imamo v proizvodnji soli še dva izjemno pomembna stranska produkta, to sta slanica in solinsko blato, dve surovini, ki sta že nekaj časa razglašena tudi kot naravna zdravilna sredstva. Za pridobivanje solinskega blata potrebujemo dve komponenti, tekočo fazo v našem primeru slanico ter trno fazo, v našem primeru je to morski sediment. Te dve komponenti združimo in začne se tako imenovani proces zorenja, ki vključuje številne biogeokemijske procese in poteka naravno v odprtih kanaljih. Danes se solinsko blato in slanico v zdravilne in lepotne namene uporablja v dveh zdraviliških centrih na ovalji ter tudi direktno na solinah v talasu spa centru Lepa Vida, ki se dohaja med solinskimi polji. Naše raziskave v sodelovanju s kolegi geologi iz Naravoslovno tehniške fakultete pa so pokazali, da zorenje vpliva tudi na sestavo solinskega blata. Namreč zorjeno solinsko blato ima nižje osebnosti določenih elementov, ki so lahko potencijalno nevarni za človeka. Tukaj mislim predvsem na težke kovine, kot so baker, svinec, rzen, kobalt in druge. Pročevali smo pa tudi kemijsko obliko teh elementov oziroma kako so vezane v samem solinskem blatu in posledično tudi njihovo mobilnost in dostopnost. No in s pomočjo eksperimenta sekvenčne ekstrakcije smo pokazali, da so ravno te, vdemo reči, problematične kovine v solinskem blatu vezane tako, da niso mobilne, torej ne predstavijo recimo tveganje za zdravje človeka pri aplikaciji solinskega blata. Naše raziskave smo predstavili v več znanstvenih člankih in so bile leta 2018 tudi vrščene v program odlični v znanosti. Za več informacij imate moj mail tukaj in nič hvala za pozornost in vabljeni vsečovejske soline. Hvala za predstavitev, thank you for the presentations. Now any questions in Slovenia and English? We have a question from Gregor Jus. Ja, slovensko vprašanje. Moje vprašanje, prej ste govorili o cijanidi, a so cijanidi tudi v kakem malem procentu? Ne cijanidi. Govorila sem o cijanobakterijah, ki so pač del mikrobne združbe, ki živi v petoli. To pa ne pravnica, to ni v vesoli prišlo. Cijanida? Ne, mislim. Naši tehnologi upravljajo pač analizo in ozorčenje soli, torej se redno spremlja elementna sestava soli in pač cenit ni bil zaznan v soli. Hvala. Ok, hvala. Me veseli no, da tudi teh zadevni noter seveda, da ni kakšne pomote. We will continue with the next presentation. Uh, by Tinkara Pinta of National Institute of Biology. Uh, can we hear each other? Okay, we can see you, but not hear you. Can you switch on the... Can you hear me? Yes, yes can you hear me? Yes, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, since uh, the field of marine microbiology is maybe not so well known in Slovenia, I felt I need to do a little bit of an uh, introduction to the topic. Um, as you can all probably imagine, oceans and seas are the largest continuous ecosystem on Earth. And they are constantly subjected to multiple natural and pathogenic perturbations. In a single milliliter of seawater, we have even up to 10 to the 6, so million bacteria and other microorganisms. And these creatures are actually the tiniest inhabitants of the ocean, but at the same time are the most abundant, metabolically active and diverse inhabitants of marine food web. And because of their size and their incredible abundance, uh, activity and diversity, they are actually almost exclusively interacting with a very big uh, pool of complex uh, organic compounds present in the ocean. And this is the dissolved organic matter pool. In fact, the dissolved organic matter pool is one of the largest reservoirs of carbon in our biosphere. And this is why microorganisms in the ocean have a major impact on global biogeochemical cycles and the global climate. And we could say very poetically that microbial processes are actually underlying the collective metabolism of the ocean. And they are influenced by environmental and anthropogenic forcing and governed by the laws of physics and chemistry. So, in our two-year study, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. In our two-year study, uh, we investigated how um, different fluctuations of environmental parameters, either occurring naturally or induced by anthropogenic forces, are structuring and influencing the microbial community in this highly dynamic coastal ecosystem uh, of the Gulf of Trieste. Uh, we wanted to understand the potential link between the community dynamics and all these uh, environmental parameters. And we employed the prediction power of the association network analysis uh, in which we, we fed with uh, these long-term measurements of different parameters, uh, both uh, physical, chemis, chemical, microbial. And these interaction maps that we can see here on the slide uh, actually help us to visualize uh, these interactions and give us and offer us uh, valuable insight into the response of the marine ecosystem to climate and anthropogenic driven stresses. What we found out was that even though this area is very shallow, the Gulf of Trieste, uh, the Slovenian part of it, uh, doesn't really exceed 30 meters, uh, the community is very different at the surface and at the bottom. And at the bottom, it's much more diverse and is very much influenced by the sedimentary suspension. On the other hand, on the surface, the seawater temperature has a profound effect on the metabolic activity of microbial community. And this can be very important in the light of the climate change, where we are even like prognosing the increase of the seawater temperature. At the same time, the structure of the community on the surface is very influenced by the fresh uh, waterborne nutrients and different phytoplankton bloom. What does this mean? It means that basically the rivers coming into the area are bringing nutrients that are causing the phytoplankton to bloom and are influencing the microbial community, uh, the structure is, so how is it composed? We also showed the importance of the water mass movements, uh, both being as the source of the fresh waterborne nutrients and at the same time of autonomous microbial taxa, meaning the taxa that is otherwise not so commonly observed in marine systems, but is brought to the system via freshwater discharges. And these taxa can be even potentially pathogenous. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I open this presentation for discussion or any potential questions. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, please, I ask the audience to, to pose questions. 
Uh, we have a question from Robert Prink. Uh, hello, uh, I am wondering, considering that in last uh, six months we had a lockdown and we saw on internet and news many uh, pictures from Venice, how everything now that water is cleaner. Uh, have you in your studies and analysis also noticed this difference? Is it important enough so that the pollution is now not so prevalent as it was before, or is it kind of similar as it was before? Thank you. Well, Thank you. Well, uh, the pollution um, is very broad <laughs> term. Uh, the transparency of the water in the uh, Venice Lagoon was probably due to the less uh, maritime traffic. Uh, of course, uh, there are other sources of pollution, which is just simply like wastewaters uh, entering the system. I'm sure that this didn't really change. And there are even like currently studies investigating how much of, uh, for example, coronavirus is discharged via wastewater discharges into the marine systems. Uh, this is, of course, largely unknown. Um, but yeah, the transparency of the seawater in general doesn't mean that it's not polluted. So I would be very careful with that. But of course, due to the lockdown, we didn't sample now. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the uh, presentation and uh, answer. Thank you. Uh, we will continue with next presentation by Veronica Kral Iglic. Can we hear each other? Okay, Hello? we see you and also hear you. Please. So I will now uh, move away this camera and just keep the voice. Okay. Okay, I will talk in English. Um, in our lab, uh, we have been uh, studying small parts of cells which are freely uh, released into the system for many years. So our first uh, project that was financed by the agency was from 2007, already with this um, thematics, and it was on mediated interactions be between membranal structures. Then we moved to cl clinical significance of these mediated interactions and came to microvesicles as risk factors for secondary thromboembolic events. So uh, these little pieces of cells which are released into the system carry with them the footprint of the cell and uh, can interact with distant cells and are uh, in fact a mechanism of uh, metastasis and uh, inflammation spreading and infection spreading. So it is, a, how to say, a very basic uh, uh, mechanism which is taking place in the body. So after uh, that, we also got an European project which was uh, <clears throat> linked to the industry. So our partner was uh, um, Enterprise Domel uh, from Železniki because they were uh, producing centrifuges and uh, if we wanted to get the extracellular vesicles, the small uh, parts of cells from body fluids, which we were up to, uh, we had to take some isolation method and uh, centrifugation was the most widely used one. So we had an idea that uh, it, th there should be, uh, in fact, a very big market available if uh, this method could come to clinical significance. So that was... Uh, Already in 2011, we had uh, uh, an, uh, a project from Eureka Initiative in which we were partners and uh, we were coordinators ourselves. But uh, now, almost 10 years after that, we can still see that there is no breakthrough of these uh, uh, extracellular vesicle-based methods to the clinical, uh, clinical praxis. So it didn't take uh, place yet. It is a great interest also, in particular in America. They, they are investing a lot of money into this field and um, the society which was formed in 2012 and uh, issues and a journal uh, got uh, the first impact factor this year and it is 10 or 11, something like that. So the, the interest is, uh, increasing greatly, but no clinical significance yet. We can say that. So it's a problem about this. Uh, then 
after that we, we had uh, only one more project financed by the agency and that was uh, from 2016 from 2016 to 2018 which was uh, to use uh, it was related to some sport results and uh, recently we have become a partner of a bigger uh, European project West for us uh, extracellular vesicles from a natural source by tailor made nanomaterials financed by uh, U European Commission um, uh, Horizon 2020 and um, it is concerning the extracellular vesicles isolated from microalgae so it's also the marine microalgae in particular, we are, we are looking for a possibility to use them to, to produce uh, the, the small vesicles in, on an industrial scale and use them for drug carriers uh, and for cosmetics. So, uh, after uh, we were also a part of a cost project, it was uh, named MEHAT, and within this collaboration, we uh, published uh, the work which was chosen for uh, um, uh, the uh, work of excellence within also the agency um, projects and we are presenting here in this slide so you can see here that uh, the picture of extracellular vesicles isolated and uh, imaged by scanning electron microscope they're very very uh, small uh, these things are let's say smaller than 100 nanometers even and um, it is, these are our pictures our own and the publication was uh, by a, a larger group of uh, collaborators uh, and we are happy to be a part of it so the agency the financing of agency helped us a lot to become partners in such a, a large uh, consortium uh, which is, I don't know, may be able to cope with uh, great problems which are uh, taking place at isolation of these tiny particles. Uh, so uh, you can see here also the, the uh, um, contributors. Okay, thank you thank for the presentation. So we have exceeded five minutes and more. Do we have any questions? Okay, Matej Mrak has a question. Please go ahead. Yes, hello, Matej Mrak speaking. I would like to ask in what, in what segment of cosmetics can these vesicles be uh, used or applied? I think they were thinking of uh, using them as platforms because they're natural uh, type uh, instead of liposomes. Okay, thank you. So we will move now to the next presentation by Nina Kosterschek from your Stefan Institute. Can we see each other? Okay, we can see. Hello. We can also hear you. Okay, Excellent. please. Thank you. Uh, so today I will present a project that was funded by the Slovenian Research Agency and was done in, co in collaboration with the Institute of Cell Biology and several departments from the Stefan Institute. So the main idea behind this project uh, was to prepare a, let's say, multifunctional nanostructure that enables both cancer treatment and imaging at the same time. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, so this nanostructure is composed of the magnetic core and optically active gold nanoshell. So magnetic core is used as a contrast agents for MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging and magnetic manipulation. And the optically active gold nanoshell possess high phototermal effect. What does this mean, phototermal effect? Then it means that this nanostructure, they strongly absorb light and they heat up. So imagine if the, we have high accumulation of such nanostructures in the cell and we irradiate them with the laser light, uh, they strongly heat up, which can uh, destroy these specific uh, cancer cells very selectively. So we started with a novel synthesis where we prepared magnetic nanoparticles with high or very good uh, magnetic properties, which is crucial for good performance as MRI contrast agents. 
Then we coat all this every individual uh, core with a silica shell and continue with gold uh, layer on the surface. Uh, so after incubation of, with these nanoparticles, uh, with normal and cancer cells, we observe that the uh, and internalization of these nanostructures in the normal cell is very very low or minimal, and the uptake by the cancer cell is actually 7.5 times higher, which is very, very important for the selective uptake and se selectivity of the treatment. Then we irradiated normal and cancer cells. And what happened? Normal cells, of course, they didn't heat up after the exposure to the lower energy laser light because practically there was no nanoparticles present uh, in the cells. And that's why cell availability remained high. Uh, on contrary, the cancer cells, they strongly heat up because of the presence of the nanostructures and the survivability drops for more than 40% already after one cycle of the treatment. So this is 10 minutes of laser irradiation. And finally, we demonstrated that these nanostructures can be used very efficiently as MRI contrast agents. So when we uh, took a look of these uh, cells and imaged them with MRI, we observed that we can easily distinguish between the normal and the cancer cells if you're using these nanoparticles. Why is this so? Because in the normal cells there is no accumulation, in the cancer cells there is high accumulation, and that's why these cells appear much, much darker. In comparison, if we use no uh, nanoparticles at all, then we cannot distinguish between the normal and the cancer cells. So basically, uh, that's it I wanted to say about the project. I would like to acknowledge all the people that were listed in the first slide. And I would like to thank for the funding as well to the research agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't see any. Thank you again for the presentation. We will move to the next one. By Natasha Ikan Kren from University Medical Center Ljubljana and Faculty of Medicine University of Ljubljana. Can you hear each other? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It's okay. Please, the floor okay. is yours. My slides are in Slovene, but I switch in, in English because of uh, prevalent language today. Uh, so, I would like to express my gratitude to organizers first, then I have to admit uh, I'm not a researcher, uh, I'm a clinician, a maxillofacial surgeon subspecialized in orthognatic uh, surgery, that means that I deal with dentofacial deformities. The most frequent uh, dentofacial deformity in Slovenia is so-called skeletal class 3, and one case uh, of this deformity is pre presented on, on the slide. The primary goal of orthognatic surgical procedure, and these are bony procedures only, is good occlusion. That means good uh, bite uh, because uh, this is demand for good orofacial functions as biting, chewing, as for speech and so on. And this can be achieved by different bony surgical procedures and they should followed by harmonious facial aesthetics. Um, please press the enter so you can see uh, with surgery we present good bite and good aesthetic. Please press enter. Uh, you see the same patient after our surgery. Let's move to the next slide, please. Traditionally used methods for diagnostic and evaluation of these patients are clinical exams, photographies, and lateral X-ray uh, cephalometry that's, uh, that's presented here. But you can imagine these are two-dimensional methods and quite subjective once uh, press enter please nowadays um, with 3d surface optical scans we can do many analysis in more objective way they these methods are different and many one as presented here is with determinations uh, of reference point 
on the facial surface. They allow us to determine distances, uh, ratios, uh, ang uh, angles to, uh, to describe the face and also their changes after surgery and press enter again, please. Mr. Lutman, and we can split the face also in different areas to determine and um, uh, facial compartments uh, separately and more more accurate and precisely. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, it's it is the fact that a uh, few years ago. Uh, it was not objective, uh, objectively known how soft tissues react to bone movements because it is clinical fact that they uh, are not changing in the same ratio. So our question of this study was what is the ratio of soft tissue changes regarding to bone, bone movements and this is uh, we did many comparison pre post you see color maps please enter and we actually uh, calculate these ratios and we found out uh, um, that this ratio is smaller than we expected um, uh, and it is fact that soft tissues follow bone movements at most for half and different in different facial areas. That was a result of our study published in our good review in 2017. But even maybe more important for us was that we also once again confirmed our results published in 2014. We were first group on the world publishing uh, published in uh, that soft facial soft tissues react as one unit. That means that uh, soft tissue changes occur also in the areas where bone underlying bones were not changed during the surgery. And that was very important um, uh, data for our field of surgery. Thank you for your kind attention and I'm, um, I'm happy with questions. <laughs> Thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, now we have a question section. We don't have any questions. Thank you again. We will move to Thank the next much. presentation. Um, I would like to invite Maya Chimajar from Institute of Oncology Ljubljana. We can see you. And Hello. Hope, yes, we can also hear you, please. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everybody, also from my side. Uh, I'm Maya Chamajer and coming from the Institute of Oncology, and I will present the work that was done in collaboration with Professor Tozon from the University of Ljubljana Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. So I would like to present the clinical study that was published in 2017 and was selected as an excellent achievement recognized by Slovenian Research Agency. So uh, what we have done in this clinical study is that we combined two different therapies that use the same delivery method that is electro-operation and combining these two therapies, one is electrochemotherapy, that is already a standard therapy, not only in veterinary medicine, but also in human medicine, and is uh, included in the European and several national guidelines for the treatment of subcutaneous tumors, and is currently used in around 160 centers, oncological centers around the Europe. So what do we do? Electrochemotherapy is actually one of the local ablative therapies where we combine chemotherapy that is injected either intravenously or intertumorally, as you can see here in the screen, screen. And after that, electric pulses are applied that make the cell membrane more permeable. Thus, uh, the chemotherapy can enter the, drug, enter the cells and kill these tumor cells. But as I said, this is a local therapy without a systemic effect. And to make this therapy a systemic also therapy, we added uh, another component, a component 
component of gene therapy, immunogene therapy. So we added a plasmid that is encoding a cytokine interleukin 12, which is a cytokine that is able to stimulate immune cells and actually activates both arms of adaptive immune system. So cytotoxic arm and also the memory. And if we actually inject also the plasmid by using the same electroporation parameter, we can also transfect the cells and these transfected cells, this is mainly stronger cells that are also present in tumor microenvironment. They then secrete the transgene. In our case, this is interleukin-12, which can go around the body and act on a distant potential metastasis. So how is it done? This was a study on a spontaneous tumors in a patient. This was in a client on dogs. So first the dogs are anesthetized, prepare, then the application of drug and plasmid DNA goes directly into the tumor. This is how the application of electric pulses go. We can use either needle electrodes or the plate electrodes. The number of applied pulses is low, is eight, and all the procedure is then actually finished in a couple of minutes. Then the dogs are checked up a regular evaluation and the treatment is evaluated. Can we go to the next slide? This is just the two examples to show you how the effect is good. So before therapy and then after several weeks or months, there is a formation of thick crust that falls off and we can achieve really nice cosmetic effects and this is also a very very long lasting effect and when we compare the results of our study with available literature data we actually looked and see that our median survival time is much much longer than after surgery or other treatment modalities for this particular tumor. So now we are in the preparation of first in human study for gene therapy, and we hope that we can we will be able to start next year on a head and neck tumors in human patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, do we have any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question by Robert Brink. Uh, hello, I think now we can, uh, you can yeah. hear me. I have a question. How many times does this treatment needs to be repeated so that it's successful? Uh, the thing is that the, re uh, the repetition of treatments actually depends on the size of the tumor. Mm -hmm. If the tumors are smaller, let's say there's a cutoff, I would say two centimeters, then usually it's actually one time treatment. And with these uh, treatments of tumor that were smaller than two centimeters, we actually achieved 100% of complete responses. But if there are bigger tumors, we usually repeat in four weeks interval. Okay, and it can be up to four or five times if necessary. Maybe if we have time for another question. Uh, how do the docs take this treatment? Are they fine or is it quite stressful for them? Uh, the thing is that uh, in human medicine we can use like local sedation or something uh, else but uh, spinal block or something but in dogs they're always anesthetized because just the injection and manipulation of dogs depends on the dogs but they're anesthetized it's short an anesthesia all the procedure is maybe with the preparation of dog takes half an hour so but after what we measured the systemic uh, side effects, there are no systemic side effects because the uh, chemotherapeutic drug dose is very low because of this potentiation by electric pulses. And all we have is maybe just this local, as I show you on the picture, like local edema or maybe some infiltration and formation of crust, but no uh, systemic side effects. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. We'll move to the next one. We have three more presentations. 
And next one is from Kristina Sevčić from Biotechnical Faculty, University of Ljubljana. Uh, I've seen that your presentation is a bit uh, longer. Um, please keep the timing of five minutes and uh, we'll have another minute for further questions. Uh, okay. okay, we can also hear you, please. So good afternoon. You will have to switch to the next slide uh, more frequently. Uh, so, uh, I will present your paper that was also selected as an exceptional achievement by the Slovenian uh, Research uh, Agency and it deals with the protein complexes that we found in oyster mushrooms, a pleurotus, that could be used as new bioinsecticides. Please, can you go to the next slide? This is just the distribution of uh, these small agarolizing proteins that can be found uh, in, uh, especially in different fungi and in bacteria. And uh, today I'm going to focus on these uh, Pleurotus osteratus um, agarolizings. Next slide, please. Uh, Pleurotus mushrooms are edible mushrooms and they are known to produce two um, important protein families proteins from the protein families that act together. Uh, one of those are uh, agarolizing proteins shown here in yellow and their names, the abbreviated names uh, in the next slides so will end with A. And uh, another proteins uh, are uh, MACPF proteins, no? so uh, proteins with membrane attack complex uh, domain that is lipid. Uh, so, these two protein, uh, proteins, uh, uh, type of proteins produced by oyster mushrooms are known to form transmembrane pores. These pores are uh, practically a uh, big component composed of um, approximately 26 uh, molecules of uh, an agarolizing, a yellow protein here, only A, and uh, 13 um, molecules of the MACPF protein partner that uh, is um, responsible for uh, this uh, uh, penetration to the membrane. Next slide, please. So what is the role of the agarolizing proteins inside this pore? Um, agarolizins are um, known to be proteins which specifically bind to membrane lipids and they especially uh, bind, bind to two uh, kinds of lipids um, that belong to the class of sphingolipids uh, sphingomyelin that is uh, present in, that is the main uh, sphingolipid of vertebrates and ceramide phosphoethanolamine uh, that is uh, the main sphingolipid uh, present in uh, invertebrates, especially in insects, in some protozoans and in some uh, gram-negative bacteria. And uh, at the right you can see the association constants of these proteins with um, the membranes containing these sphingolipids you can see that agarolysins interact um, more than 100 times stronger with these insect-specific um, sphingolipid. So the presence of this uh, sphingolipid, which is specific to insects and not found in uh, the cells of vertebrates, and uh, the ability of agarolysins to bind to these lipids and to form uh, transmembrane pores in uh, concert with their MACPF protein partners, led us to uh, perform some um, insecticidal tests in, um, in uh, well, collaboration with Agricultural Institute of Slovenia. Can you go uh, further, please? And here are some of the tested insect pests. And uh, as you can see at the right, uh, the only beetles that were um, the only insects that were susceptible to our proteins that died after the treatment were uh, Colorado potato beetle and Western corn rootworm that are also one of the economically uh, most important um, well pests of uh, corn and potatoes. Next slide please. Here are the survival curves uh, after treatment uh, of uh, Colorado, Colorado potato beetle with our protein complexes. Uh, the, the larvae and uh, well, adults were fed with um, potato leaves soaked in the, our protein complexes. And um, after the first injection of the uh, ingestion of this uh, food, they uh, stopped to eat and they died of starvation. Uh, you can see below uh, in the petri dishes that uh, treated larvae were much smaller from the untreated. 
and the LD50 was quite low. Next slide, please. And the same effects were observed also with uh, Western corn root form. Next slide, please. So, um, to conclude, uh, I would like to say that protein proteinaceous uh, bioinsecticides are not new in agriculture. Since the um, 1960s, um, 1960s um, um, some bacterial proteins are used, and uh, pro these are proteins from bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, there are 3, 000, uh, 300 of these proteins approximately, and their mechanism of action is um, by binding to protein receptors in the insect midgut. Uh, the problem is that uh, many insects uh, have developed resistance to these proteins, and one of the mechanisms of the resistance is, uh, well, modification of, their, of the protein receptor. Well, um, one of the possibilities that our agrolysin MECPF uh, complexes could have some um, future uh, to be used there as uh, bioinsecticides is their ability to bind not to a protein receptor but to a lipid receptor. So in the constitutive uh, molecule that is uh, building also biological membrane and this is um, lipids are less prone to modifications and mutations. So perhaps the chances of developing resistance by, from uh, insects could be lowered. Uh, these uh, results are uh, um, also covered by an international patent application. And if, I can, if you can go further, please. I would like to thank, of course, the Slovenian Research Agency for financing us. And uh, special thanks to uh, the Knowledge Transfer Office of the University of Ljubljana, who helped us a lot. And on the right, th there are the people that uh, contributed uh, to this work from our group. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, I will have a question myself. Uh, so, um, in the morning sessions, we heard that um, one of the important factors is um, regulation, uh, which influences the, the speed of commercialization of such uh, very important uh, environmentally friendly technologies. And uh, what is uh, the case in this uh, field? So is there already some reg regulatory um, established in on the level of uh, European Union? I don't know. Well, our, uh, our complexes are now being uh, tested by one of the companies that have expertise in this uh, plant protection. The results are quite good and, uh, you know, we are basic researchers uh, and we need the help of uh, another partners. I could not answer this question. I'm just an ordinary okay. biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you uh, for the presentation again. We Thank will you. move to the next one. Uh, Gregor Bilosic from Biotechnical Faculty as well. Uh, Hello, everyone. Okay, we can see you. Mm -hmm. We can also hear you. Yeah, please. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Or yours. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so, our study uh, that was awarded by the research agency and the University of Ljubljana uh, is a, a study on uh, polarization vision and horse flies. These are uh, quite exceptional insects in terms that they use uh, polarization vision detection of uh, polarized light for the detection of their targets, their prey, uh, and also water bodies and also navigation. Uh, so target detection is performed uh, by seeing uh, the horizontally polarized reflections from uh, mammalian fur. And if we observe a, a shiny horse uh, through polarized sunglasses, uh, you can see that uh, under a horizontal angle, the horse appears shiny and under uh, a vertical angle, the horse will appear as a uh, uh, non shiny and um, uh, instead of rotating sunglasses, uh, horse flies are equipped with uh, photoreceptive cells that uh, are sensitive either to horizontally or vertically polarized light. We know that because we found it, of course. Uh, and uh, this is um, quite frequently found in uh, other insects, uh, but uh, horse flies are like specialized for this and they have a prominent behavior. And these uh, photoreceptors occur in discrete optical units of the insect compound I call the omatidia. Each unit is an equivalent to um, a camera pixel and harbors uh, photoreceptors that uh, 
uh, convey signals to the channel for achromatic vision, color vision, and as we learned also, polarization vision. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, we used uh, first uh, the anatomical an analysis of uh, horsefly retina to identify the um, candidate cells that uh, could be used for polarization vision. And uh, uh, we used serial sectioning with a special uh, serial block face uh, scanning electron microscope to find cells that have a aligned and straight uh, light sensing organelles and do not perform a twist such as we see on the left uh, side panel receptors are marked with r1 to r6 and we see that two that one pair of receptors r7h and r8h have a, a straight uh, straight uh, light sensing organelles uh, and every, everything else is uh, rotated so the straight pair is the suitable candidate for detection of polarized light then we used microelectro recordings to uh, characterize the spectral sensitivity of these cells and we found that the polarization channel only works in the ultraviolet and blue channel while ultraviolet and uh, green sensitive cells form uh, pairs for the detection of uh, colors and then we went to the field and uh, we attracted uh, horse lights with uh, shiny beach uh, balls that are spherical approximations of horses and cows and then we suspended the balls below uh, color filters and we found that if we eliminate uh, UV and blue light the horse flies were equally not interested as if the balls were not not shiny as is the case with the matte ball if we suspended the balls below blue filters the horses uh, the horse flies got extremely excited because we know that we enhanced the contrast in the uh, polarization analyzer pair and we also uh, abolished the green light which acts as repelling next slide please former slide please yes thank you so um, our research impact uh, uh, of the study uh, is first of all uh, that we explain the neural basis of uh, animal behavior we know how the horsefly attack is triggered they must observe a dark object they must uh, see the reflection in the ultraviolet and blue channel and the object should not be reflecting uh, green light which helps uh, uh, obviously horseflies to discriminate shiny horses or cows from shiny leaves uh, those uh, cells are situated in a special segregated uh, class of omatidia uh, that form together with other omatidia the so-called retinal mosaic which is a stochastic system which is a model system in developmental neuro neurobiology very similar to the one found in the model animal fruit flies so the found findings have implications for neuro uh, developmental neurobiology in general we also explain the mechanism of, of uh, color trapping uh, we know that uh, horse flies are extremely attracted to blue, uh, which does not reflect UV, and an equal situation is found in traps used for city flies, so which are much more dangerous than for, for flies. And uh, we know how to optimize those traps and uh, make super traps. And then the retina is also a blueprint for a hybrid imaging sensor, so we know how the horse flies approximately see their targets in the polaris polarimetric channel in the UV and blue, not in the green. And uh, equally, we can uh, use a hybrid sensor to detect, for example, uh, cars that are also polarized objects, even if the camera is optically degraded, such as is the case with horsefly retina, which has a very low resolution. And uh, along with the study, we developed a new stimulation system, which was successfully applied for the detection of uh, color blindness in humans. So a stimulation system that was used for horsefly characterization equally well performs in detecting uh, human subjects without uh, mid or long wavelength sensitive cones and now we are developing this system together with the eye clinic hospital for uh, the clinical testing uh, in an objective manner thank you for your attention questions welcome okay thank you very much do we have any questions uh, milos shinkovitz uh, you have a question Mr. Shinkos, uh, uh, hello. Yes, okay. We can uh, you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, but uh, I have a question for uh, uh, presentation uh, for uh, Mrs. Uh, about insecticide uh, and uh, not for Mr. Gregor Belushich. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, will you? 
you are in the uh, you are in the wrong uh, session. probably you missed my my message <laughs> sorry for your uh, question maybe but you can ask the question to uh christina Sipcic. are we still online yes but i don't have any okay 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 hello uh, i have hello. one question what is the effect use of the insecticide uh, compared to the current one and uh, what about the availability of this insecticide it is possible uh -huh. uh, and when well uh, it is comparable for the western root conform uh, it is comparable to the bt toxins from bacillus yes, 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 yes. So for the colorado potato beetle it is yes. uh, even, it is better uh well the availability you know we are on a laboratory uh, scale yeah, i know i know i understand okay uh, uh and to, uh, do you think it is possible uh, when uh we maybe buy this uh, insecticide well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you see we, we first uh, have to test uh, its okay. uh, activity on a non-target organisms for example yes, on, on bees and other insects and mammals and uh, other you know non-targets we are doing this now uh, yes, actually no. so uh, okay. we are not uh, you know big, uh, <laughs> i know i know thank you welcome okay thank you for the questions maybe are there any questions for professor Benusic? doesn't seem to be the case we will uh finish with the uh, last but not least uh uh, presentation by Katrina Coulter of Faculty of Medicine. Uh, are you here? Can we hear each other? No, doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, we have some technical issues. Okay. Uh, we can hear you, but not see you. Can you hear us? <clears throat> we Okay, we will uh, continue with the, uh, the uh, award um, by WIPO and we will come back to your presentations once we uh, solve the technical issue. Uh, Marieta, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Please uh, announce the award medal for inventors. Okay, thank you very much. As already mentioned in the morning, um, this year we have among our co-organizers also World Intellectual Property Organization and the Slovenian Intellectual Property Office. Uh, we are very ha happy and honored to have them on board. In the morning, we already announced the WIPO IP Enterprise Trophy that went to Razvoni Center ENM Novi Materiali DOO that is constantly and methodologically using their IP system, using the IP system in their business activities. Now, uh, at the, almost at the end of the conference, we wish to announce the second Viper Award. This is the Viper Medal for Inventors. Uh, before I announce the award winner, uh, let me um, um, tell you who was the uh, um, member of the evaluation commission. These were Dr. Jeff Skitter and uh, Dr. Jon Wolf Peterson that you already met in the morning, and Mr. Alois Barlic from the Slovenian Intellectual Property Office. Um, they had a careful look at all the applications that we received. They were uh, looking at the granted patents with examination, those without examination, and granted utility models. 
and then they had a look at what was the impact on the Slovenian economy via creation of new entities, companies in Slovenia, creation of new jobs, and uh, new products or services launched to the Slovenian or international market based on the uh, cooperation with based on the cooperation uh, between uh, economy and uh, research. So, after the careful ranking, they have decided that the VIPO medal for inventors goes to Professor Dr. Alenka Veseu. And here is their short justification. In the last decade, uh, Professor Alenka Veseu got granted several international patents. She is a co-founder of company Plasm Plasmatis. The company focuses on plasma systems. Her IP assets resulted in different products and services being brought to the market. For example, a sensor for plas plasma characterization. Among services, we could point out the characterization of seeds in agriculture. Con uh, congratulations to Professor Veseu. The uh, awards will be given tomorrow at the conference ceremony that is taking place at uh, half past 11. Uh, everybody can uh, see the ceremony via the live streaming, streaming on the Institute's TV channel. Congratulations once again, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you, Tomasz. The floor is yours. Um, okay, we are still um, having some technical issues for connecting Katrina Kotar. Um, okay, maybe um, Since it's uh, last presentation, um, I can uh, maybe per show her slides. Uh, I doubt we can uh, solve the issue in, uh, in these few minutes that we have. Katarina, I, I see you can hear me, but we cannot hear you. Um, Okay, this is the first slide. In the second slide, um, you can have a look on the slides for for a minute or two. Okay. Unfortunately, we cannot um, have the presentation of uh, Katrina Kotar. Um, I'm really sorry for this technical issue. Um, uh, I hope we you can have uh, the the opportunity to present uh, next time. So um, I would like to close the, 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 the sessions with uh, now uh, I'm giving the floor to, to Spila Stris, uh, head of Center for Technology Transfer and Innovation of uh, Jorge Stefan Institute. Spila, please. Oh, hello again. I'm here to close this year's conference. Uh, the topic of the conference was how to maximize the impact of technology transfer funnel at the TTOs. So I think I have an answer to that question now. I, I was listening to the presentations and there was this Slovene proverb that came to my mind saying, water dripping day by day, where's the hardest rock away? Tiha voda bregove dere. In tech transfer is always going to be the silent water, almost going unnoticed. But that is how you maximize the impact of tech transfer.
by being persistent and persistently professional. As I think was this year's conference, professional in every aspect. I'm happy though that the conference is behind us because there really is a lot of work put into it every year. And I think um, that I have to thank all my colleagues here of the Center for Technology Transfer and Innovation of Jose Stefan Institute who worked tirelessly for the conference to take place in such a diverse format and with such perfect execution. But what actually mattered today was that everyone who followed this conference was able to feel how far we can go with the collective spirit of the researchers from all public research organizations in Slovenia. And I have high hopes that all tech trans transfer offices are going to join into that spirit as well. This has been a lovely event. Despite the COVID-19 situation, I now feel this was the best conference we have ever had. Thank you all and see you soon. <laughs>